Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It reads this way from the English Standard Version. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, the tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene. How did I do? <laughs> During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the, Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. This morning from our passage, I would like to title our text from this passage, our sermon from this passage, excuse me, a blazing word, a blazing word. If you all would preach, if you all would preach, if you all would pray, I believe that the Lord will speak. Triumphant, as we are on this Lenten pathway in preparation for Easter, this year I felt led to take an unconventional approach to Lent by looking at the life of an unconventional man who prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ. I feel like God has led us to take a look at the life of this trailblazer to in some way encourage and motivate the trailblazers among us. For John the Baptist was unapologetically a trailblazer, a forerunner for Jesus Christ. He made no qualms about it. He was very crystal clear about the fact that his role was to point people to Jesus and to make straight the paths to him. And so what I am praying that as we look into how the life of John the Baptist and his ministry prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus, that it will also prepare our hearts to celebrate in grand fashion on Easter Sunday morning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But also in looking at his life over the next few weeks, I'm praying that it will sow some seeds, that it will stir up in some of us to understand the power and the significance of trailblazers. I'm praying that it will spur along some of us that we would decide to take the path less taken so that our lives will also point people to Jesus. I'm praying that it will embolden and empower and inspire in us the courage and the boldness needed to be trailblazers. So that instead of being those who shrink back and shriek the responsibility of calling, of the calling of God on our lives, that instead that we fully embrace our callings, our callings to be disciple makers of Jesus Christ, and that we would blaze pathways that lead someone else to their eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. I know that that may sound odd in a time where everyone is looking out for self-interest and self-promotion and promoting themselves. But it's important to know and to remember that before Jesus' ministry took off, God empowered and sent John the Baptist as a forerunner to prepare the way and to blaze a trail that would allow Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, to launch as a result. 
And I think that this is particularly significant in this month in which we celebrate the achievement and the accomplishments of African Americans who have gone before us and who have been trailblazers for us. Because lest we forget, before there was a Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there was a Reverend Sandy Frederick Ray, who Reverend King called one of the strongest orators in the African American church. But perhaps you don't know who Reverend Sandy Ray is, but surely you've heard of the name Frederick Douglass, who paved the way as well. But remember, before there was a Vice President Kamala Harris, there was a Shirley Chisholm. And before there was a Stacey Abrams, there was a Fannie Lou Hamer leading the way. And before there was a Hank Aaron, there was a Jackie Robinson. And before there was a Muhammad Ali, there was a Joe Lewis and a Jack Johnson. And before there was Serena or Venus Williams, there was an Arthur Ashe. And before there was Amanda Gorman, there was Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Octavia Butler. And before there was a Perrin Rogers, blazing the trail was Pastor T.L. Rogers. And before Pastor T.L. Rogers, there was Uncle George, Pastor George B. Rogers, blazing the trail for him. And before there was Air Jordan, there was Dr. J. <laughs> and before Angela Davis said, fight the power, there was Sojourner Truth saying, resist the power. And before Rosa Parks said, nah, Harriet Tubman said, I'm out. And before Kirk Franklin told us to stomp, there was Thomas Dorsey who told us to ask the precious Lord to take our hand. And before Aretha told us about respect, don't forget Mahalia told us how we got over. And before President Barack Obama told us that he had the change we needed, don't forget we had Reverend Jesse Jackson who told us to keep hope alive. What am I trying to say? That someone has paved the way for all of us. And truth be told, we're all just paving the way for someone else. And so it's time for the people of God to stop shrinking back and shying away from the ordained callings on our lives. And it's time for us to break out to step up and to start blazing trails. Have you noticed how, as of late, it seems that people are always looking for someone else to go first? They're always looking for someone else to step up and to do something first. It's like when we were younger, when we would go to the haunted house, we would go to the door of the house and we'd say, no, you go first, you go first, you go first. We're always waiting for somebody else to go first so they can take the licks and they can take the wounds. We need some forerunners in our generation. We need some prophets that will get out front. We need some people who will raise their voice. And church, we ought to support them and thank God for their courage and their willingness to take risk and to get out front. But we ought to be on the front lines ourselves right beside them. And this morning, I want to speak to some people who since they have some forerunner in them, even some parent who's watching, and perhaps you feel and you know you have a little trailblazer on your hands. Someone needs some encouragement not to be afraid to blaze a trail. Not to be afraid to continue in the line of John the Baptist and even Jesus himself. Someone needs to know that it's okay to be different. Because no one who ever fit in ever stood out. And so I'm praying that God will raise up some more trailblazers. And indeed, I believe he is. I believe God is raising up a new generation of trailblazers. God is raising up some prophets and some proclaimers right here in our generation. People who will raise their voices. People that will have the courage and the conviction and the compassion to blaze a different path for the sake of Christ and for righteousness. That we will all in some fashion understand that we have special calls on our lives to be disciple makers who are pointing people to Jesus. 
that we, like John the Baptist, are those who are clearing the way for Jesus to come into the lives of others. I still believe that the prophecy of Joel, find in Joel chapter 2, is still true and is still being fulfilled. That God is pouring out his spirit on all people. And that our sons and our daughters will prophesy. That our young men will see visions and our old men will dream dreams. I believe that God will even pour out his spirit on his servants in these days. And both men and women will prophesy. And this idea of the prophet leads us directly back to our passage this morning. Because in this passage, what Luke is doing is that he is presenting to us John the Baptist as a prophet. Y'all stick with me. In Luke, already in chapter 1, he has, by way of introducing this whole idea of Jesus coming, he tells us that um, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, um, Zechariah, um, he is visited by an angel, Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel says this to him in chapter um, 1, verse 17, that John the Baptist, his son, would go before Jesus in the spirit and power of the prophet Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children and that the disobedient would be turned to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And then again, Luke has introduced it in chapter 1, verse 76, where he, John the Baptist's father, is prophesying over John the Baptist after he has been born. And he says to his son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. But when we get to chapter 3, with the setting that Luke places John the Baptist's ministry in as it's about to take off, and with the opposition in his ministry that he faces with those who are in political power because eventually John the Baptist gets arrested and um, his head gets cut off, assassinated because of this radical message that he has. And it's clear that, as one commentator says, it's clear that John is being portrayed by Luke as a prophet, hear this, who is concerned with social renewal and transformation. John the Baptist, he says, is concerned with social renewal and transformation. It's obvious that this is the case because why would a political leader want to get him in jail if it did not have some social renewal concerns? And so if that does not strike a chord with you, I just want to I want you to wake up, and I want you to know that that should strike a chord to you because what we hear there is that it is in line with the prophetic voices of those of our civil rights movement who were concerned with social renewal and transformation as well. They cried out for civil rights, for social renewal, and for social transformation. And that also led to hostility that they faced and even death and assassination of them as well. And the reason I point this out is because we need to know that the voices of our black church tradition, the historical black church, they did not in some way abandon the gospel because they voiced how it should have social implications. They did not abandon the gospel because they said that the gospel should affect how we treat others. Rather, that they understood that the outworking of the gospel should be demonstrated in how we treat one another. That how we love one another, it is fed by our sensitivity to our love for God. That if we have true love for God, that we will have true love for one another. And it is necessary to point this out because as we consider how those who have gone before us in our faith tradition tradition as the black church in America and how they had a concern for the social renewal and transformation of our society, that we too now need to continue to take up that champ, that cause. We need to continue to take up that cause unapologetically. 
that we too are concerned about the social renewal and transformation of our society. But if we're going to do that, we have to remain people who are wholly committed to the word of God. This takes us back to our text because what we see in our text this morning is the power and the force and the centrality that the word of God plays in the ministry of John the Baptist. In fact, I would say that it was God's word that had more to do with blazing the trail for Jesus than John the Baptist himself. It was the word that was blazing the trail because it was a blazing word. I want you to hear again the force of our text this morning, and I don't want you to miss it. You saw that chapter 3, it begins with this long list of politicians whose names I can barely pronounce. Tiberius Caesar, he was the emperor. He was the one that took over for Caesar Augustus. Pontius Pilate, he was the governor. Herod was the tetrarch of the area where Jew, um, the Jews lived, the Hebrews, Israelites lived. And then his Philip had another region, and then that other guy's name, he had another region. And then it was also during the time of when Annas, Annas, Annas was the priest of the church of Israel, um, the temple of Israel. And Caiaphas was also, actually, Annas was the old one, Caiaphas was the new one, but Annas was still in power, even though Caius was supposed to be in charge. And, and here it is, is that, is that God's word comes to John in the midst of all of this. Listen to verse number two. It says, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John. It came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Y'all, I don't want us to miss the force of our text this morning. Because after all those names that we cannot pronounce, it is during all of that that the word of God came to John in the wilderness. What sets all of this ablaze? It was the word of God. See, even within the, 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 the cloudiness of the political climate that was going on at that time, the political climate, social political climate of that day, it was complicated at best and it was chaotic at worst. You hear all of these rulers and these rulers were looking out for themselves. They were using their power and their, their position to, 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 to serve themselves. They were using their, their power and their position so that they could be privileged. And in the midst of all of this, God's word came. In the midst of this confusing political climate that was chaotic and complicated and unrest, God's word came. And even while John was in the wilderness, God's word came. This passage is designed to draw our attention to God's word. It's the force of this text. It is the verb that stands out. And I want to encourage someone that you can be in a wilderness place. You can be in the midst of a complicated place. You can be in the midst of a complex and chaotic place. But if God's word comes to you, it can set everything ablaze. God's word can turn your situation around. Sometimes all you need is just a word from the Lord. Just one word will do. You don't even have to give me a whole sermon. Sometimes it's just that one word. See, God's word came to an unconventional person, skipping over all of the people that were in positions of influence and power, even skipping over those who were in charge of the temple, God's word came to John the Baptist, an unconventional dude who they said wore clothes that was made of camel's hair. Y'all, he ate locusts and honey. It was, it's weird now, and it was weird back then. But God skipped over all of those people, and he brought his word 
to John the Baptist. And he brought his word to him while he was out in the wilderness. This is, means that he is out in a desert place, a, de a place that, is, that does not have resources. And God's word met him there. I want to tell somebody what you need in your wilderness season. What you need in your complicated season. What you need in your season of chaos is a word from the Lord. You don't need an inspirational talk. You don't need a motivational speaker. You don't need a self-improvement book. You don't even need a 12-step program. All you need is a word from the Lord. And I just wonder if there's anyone, perhaps even in the room, who you've been in a wilderness moment, and you've been in a complicated moment, and you've been in a chaos moment, but you got a word from the Lord, and it changed the direction and the trajectory of your life. Just when you thought you were about to get up, you, you give up. God whispered a word to you, and it changed your life. See, sometimes you have to get in a wilderness place to actually get the word from the Lord. Because it's in the wilderness place that you actually remove the distractions where you're finally able to hear God's word to you. And I want to encourage somebody today, if you're looking for a word from the Lord, I want you to know that a word has come. A word has come, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> His name is Jesus. Jesus will turn your life around. John chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That was Jesus, and he has come. He is God's word to us. God has revealed himself through his written word and even through Jesus, his living word. And so I hope that you see in verses 1 and 2, the setting in which the word came. Because the setting in which the word came is so important. Because it came in the middle of the wilderness. It came during a chaotic, complex, confusing time. But also, we need to know that because if we're going to be a part of John the Baptist's legacy and the legacy of the prophetic voice of the black church in America, we cannot and we must not abandon the word of God. If we're going to continue to be a prophetic voice as the black church in America, we cannot and we must not abandon the word of God. Last week I heard my dear colleague, Dr. Charlie Dates, who pastors Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago, he said this last Sunday. He said, by and large, the black church in America has believed the Bible is the word of God and not just that it claims to be the word of God. They believe, we believe, by and large, that the Bible is the word of God and not just that it claims to be the word of God. And to quote him some more, he says, the problem some people have with that statement is that we know that for years, the Bible has been abused and misused for the wrongful oppression of black and brown people in America. And so we have come to question the truthfulness of the scriptures by the integrity of its worst abusers. We don't believe the Bible is true because people abuse it and misuse it. But he says, we, ju we judge the quality of nothing else in our life by the testimony of its worst abusers. So it doesn't make the Bible wrong. It indicts the integrity of their wrongful oppressors. It doesn't make the Bible wrong. It indicts the integrity of of our wrongful oppressors who misused and used the Bible. I wish I had time to say more on that, but i got to quickly move on. But I just want to say that to remind us that if we're going to be trailblazers in the line of John the Baptist and in the line of those prophetic voices of the black church that came before us, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 
Yes, we saw him on the mall giving the I have a dream speech, but he was at his church on Sunday morning preaching and proclaiming the word of God. And if we're going to be trailblazers, we've got to cleave to and stand firmly on God's word. But the second thing that we see in this text is that not only do we notice the setting in which the word came, but we also need to notice that the word was proclaimed. What does it say John proclaimed? In verse number three, it says that John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? That's what John proclaimed? Perhaps that wasn't the word that many of you were expecting or that you were looking for. And everything that was going on, that's the word that John proclaimed? I want to let you know that just as unpopular as it was then, it's just as unpopular now. Repentance for the forgiveness of sin? Now, nah, people, don't, people don't get with that these days. <laughs> People are too enlightened and too intelligent to think that, first of all, that we have sin or even that there is a God, and then that we need to repent of our sins. But the ministry of John the Baptist that prepared the way of Jesus Christ, it was characterized by a call to repentance. Repentance is what John the Baptist proclaimed. The word repentance literally means in the original language a change of heart or mind. Repentance, hear me, is not simply about a decision, but it is also about a change of direction. Repentance is a word of redirection. It is a word of turning. Repentance isn't simply about words you say, but it is about the direction in which you walk after you say those words. Repentance is a big idea that we relegate to just what we do when we get saved. And so we think because we said the words that we're saved. But if you said the words, but you don't walk what you said, have you really been saved? Are you waking up every day, moving in the direction of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Or are you waking up every day, moving in the direction of what you want, and Jesus Christ is getting in your way to get, from where, to, to get where you want to go? Your pleasures, your desires. Repentance is saying, no, I'm turning away from my things, and I am moving in the direction of Jesus Repentance, though, is a word of liberation because it means not only have I been saved um, from my sins, but I'm also saved for, from, excuse me, not only have I been saved for my sins because of my sins, but I've been saved from my sins so I don't have to sin anymore. See, repentance was just as radical then as it is now. People have got real quiet on me because repentance is not that idea that we like to sit with, is it? But the fact that forgiveness of sin was being offered, that meant that repentance of sin would have to be given. Jesus offers us forgiveness of sin. He says, if you'll repent, I'll forgive you. But the question is, will we Will we repent? What John is saying here is that if we'll repent, it can turn our lives around. That's what John is saying. John is saying that if we repent, that it will turn our world upside down. That if we repent, the, the, the chaos and the, the, the unclarity and, and the lack of clarity, the chaos, and, and the, the complicated nature of our situations will be turned around if we'll repent. He is saying that if we repent, that it will make ready 
the way for Jesus to come into our lives. Y'all, that's not a popular idea. That's an idea that people who think that they're intelligent think is antiquated and foreign. But repentance, it can still turn things around for us. I don't know if anyone else has ever found themselves in a place where they have been lost, in a place where they didn't know which way to turn. I'm not just talking about metaphorically. I'm talking about literally. Like, that, Has anybody been driving and you find yourself, you're, you, you, perhaps you even had the GPS on, but, but you know how, how your, mind, your, 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 your mind can start to wander and you forget to listen to the GPS and so you forget to make a turn? Or perhaps you decided you was going to take your own way and so you didn't listen to the turn that it told you to make and then you find yourself someplace and you're in a place that you're just lost and you're stuck. You've gotten off track. They don't do this with um, GPS systems anymore, but, but, but there was a time when if you missed a turn, the, the GPS system, the lady would say, you are being rerouted. You are being rerouted. And here's the thing is that if we ever find ourselves in a place where we are stuck or we are lost, we need to know repentance is our opportunity to be rerouted. That if we will repent and if we will say, God, I should have listened to you when you told me to turn right and instead I turned left. I should have listened to you when you told me to slow down and instead I sped up. God, I should have listened to you when you told me not to go there and I went there anyway. But God is saying even if you find yourself in a place where it is chaotic and it's a mess and it's a wilderness, if you will just repent, I will reroute you all the way back to me. Listen, we all get stuck from time to time. <clears throat> we all get lost from time to time. I know I do. I know I get lost in things that I should not get lost in. I know I get stuck in a rut that I should not be in. But repentance can bring us back on course. Repentance reroutes us so that we get back on track. Who is listening to me today and you have gotten off track? You, are you have found yourself in a place and you're asking yourself, how in the world did I get here? But actually, you know how you got there, but you don't know how to get out of it. I encourage you to repent when God told you to go right and you went left and allow God to reroute you back to him. Because here's the thing that I love about God is that you know how sometimes you take a trip and it takes like forever to get to where you're going. But on the trip back, it goes by like that. That's how God does us. See, God, if we'll just turn back around to him, he will make it quick for us to get back to him. He'll dry, he'll, he'll clear the pathway so that we can get back to him. Matter of fact, that's what we see next in this text, is that we see that not only was that the word, the, see the word came and the word proclaimed, but we also see the word is paved. Here it is, is that it says that it will be like Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked places shall become straight. The rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Here it is. It's God saying, if you will turn back around to me, I'll make the pathway straight and you'll be able to get to me real quick. You'll be able to see the salvation of God. See, I just wonder if there's anyone here who has ever repented and turn 
your life around. And as you repented, God turned your life around. You were headed in one direction, about to knock your head upside a wall, but God said, I am rerouting you, and he turned your life around. He turned the trajectory of your life around because you said, God, I'm sorry. I confess my sins. I'm sorry. I know that I'm a sinner, and I am in need of a Savior. Would you please forgive me? And God turns your life around. I love the fact that our lives can be, routed, be, be rerouted even after we get off track. But, but let's, let's make sure that we don't miss what, what Luke is saying here as he is citing Isaiah. He is, he's citing Isaiah, and, and as he's mentioning this, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke is saying that, listen, there. There is this idea, this, this picture that you need to see is that when you repent, it is like leveling the obstacles that are getting in the way of God getting to you. See, you're, 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 you're removing the obstacles in order for God to get to you. See, it's not that you have to work for God to get to you, but you have to make sure that there is nothing in the way in order for God to get to you. Because the thing that you need for God to get to you is nothing. But as long as you are doing something and as long as there are obstacles in the way, God can't get to you. But if you will get those obstacles out the way, if you would bring those high places that you have in your life, if you'll bring them down low, and if you'll bring those low places that you have in your life and bring them, level them up, and if you'll take those crooked places and you'll bend them and make them straight, God says, now I got a way to you. Now I can save you. Now I can provide for you. Now I can turn your life around. It starts with repentance. And that's why we have to, that's why we have to cleave to God's word so that we will, we will know that yes, God, I got stuff in the way. This role building metaphor, it is, it is a metaphor that helps us to understand how we individually need to be ready for the coming Messiah to be made known in our lives. We, we all need to be ready. And there's some things that we need to get out of the way in order for Jesus to come. I don't know if you've ever seen a presidential motorcade before, but I have. I tell the story all the time because I am so um, happy and that I've had the privilege of meeting President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. I, I had the, pre the privilege of meeting them. And I'll never forget that when they were about to come to the location where we were, um, the, the, the Secret Service, they said, Okay, everybody stand still because the presidential motorcade is about to come through. And as you saw the motorcade coming down the street, what you saw was cars getting out of the way. They had police out front in order to make sure that the cars would get out the way. Why were they getting out the way? because the president was coming through on that road. That is the picture that we have here, is that the obstacles that are on our road, we have to get them out the way in order for Jesus to come in on that path to get to us. It is not just president, but it is King Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one that is coming to you. Will you get that stuff out the way? What do you need to move out the way? Do you need to move your will out the way? Somebody needs to tell God you can move that over. Do you need to move your ego out the way? Somebody needs to tell God you can move that out the way. Do you need to move your plans out the way? Somebody needs to tell God you can move that over too. Do you need to move your schedule out the way, you can move that over to God. Listen, there's, there's a song Jonathan McReynolds sings called Make Room for God. And there are things in our lives that are in the way and God has no room to get to you because those things are taking the seat where he's supposed to be sitting. And repentance is the idea of getting those things out the way 
Because you know that once God comes through, he will reroute you, he will change things around, and he will put your life on a trajectory that you cannot imagine. Matter of fact, he will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask, think, or imagine. That's what God is able to do. So my itinerary, you can move that over. My habits, you can move that over. My attitude, you can move that over. Whatever it is, you can move that over. Anything that's not like you, God, you can move that over. Matter of fact, search me, oh God. And if you find anything that is not like you, God, move that over. God, whatever is taking your space, you can move that over. God, Instagram feeds, you can move that over. Facebook feeds, you can move that over. Secret websites, you can move that over. Late night text conversations, God, you can move that over. Living where I have no business living, God, you can move that over. Whatever it is, God, move it over. God, you are my number one. You are my priority. And God, I want you to come and change my situation. But I know I've got to start at nothing. So God, whatever it is. If it's my job, you can move it over. If it's my children, you can move that over. If it's my fleshly desires, you can move that over. If it's the fact that I like to gossip, you can move that over. The fact that I, I just like to be lazy, you can move that over. I, I, I want you to, to really reflect on what is it that you need to move out the way. Because here it is. It's that God wants to turn your life around. And even late in the midnight hour, God can turn it around. He could turn it around and around and around and around. I know you feel like you're in a wilderness and God can't get to you, but I want you to know that if you'll repent, if you'll make room for God, he'll meet you. Almost every night, Lady Key and I are in bed together and <clears throat> about one, two o'clock in the morning, last night it was 12 o'clock in the morning, our youngest son, Hudson, three-year-old, gets out of bed. You can hear the pitter-patter feet coming down the steps. And he gets in our bed right in the middle of us. We could be nice and cuddled up, but you know what he does? He makes room. He says, whatever I got to do, I'm going to make room for myself right here. And that's the audacity some of us need to have. That God, our Father, wants us to make room for him. And so whatever we have to do, even if it's late in the midnight hour, we will make room for him. I promise if you do, you'll see the salvation of the Lord. Father God, I thank you for your, this time that we've had in your word. God, I thank you for the assurance to know that your word, as it goes out, it never returns void. And I pray right now that if seeds have been planted, that you would bear it for our good, but ultimately for your glory. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And we all say, thank God.